Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. Today on Spotlight, secrets behind some of the most astonishing Guinness World Records to ever be set. Plus, details about a project about the varieties of bees in St. Louis and what this means facing climate change. And then growing food and donating it to local communities, what this effort hopes to achieve. But first, why WashU built their very own city and what they hope to learn from it. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. At first glance, this looks like a regular city street. But look a little closer, and you'll see this city is actually much less than meets the eye, at least in terms of its size. This project is our Washington University in St. Louis mini city that has a series of different attributes that you can mistake for a real city. It's pretty big. It's about 30 feet by 100 feet. The scale is 1 to 8 scale. For comparison, Barbie is about 1 to 6 to give you a sense of things that you might have interacted with. And that scale is important because the goal is to test autonomous vehicles in a realistic but safe way. This is typically the evaluation of autonomy of any kind has kind of two phases. One is in simulation, which is relatively easy, relatively low cost, but of course there's always a gap to what actually really happens. The other is, is actual physical scale. Now in physical scale, you can't take really major risks. For example, any risk of crashing, uh, you could crash on people, for example. There's all kinds of issues when taking major risks. Here, we can actually take pretty substantial risks without really severe consequences. Worst case scenario, okay, we damage, for example, a car. Uh, okay, not great, but not tragic, as opposed to, for example, a real car crashing into something. But creating this mini city took a rather unusual collaboration between the university's departments of computer science and architecture. The city has uh, convincing mailboxes, facades, trash cans, trees, people. The people don't walk around. Everybody always asks that. They're not motorized. Um, but composing the city really was a question of like looking into, OK, what, what do you encounter? How, how is a crosswalk going to be identifiable? OK, we've got to paint a crosswalk that looks similar. Color matching, we would go out into the street and like color match our yellow paints from Home Depot to the actual paint on the street. Um, so there was a lot of reproduction of, of reality in this sort of way that you might think about a theater set uh, being built. As far as the actual testing on those roads go, they're still in the early phases of what's set to be a 10-year project one they hope will provide results that are helpful in the real world. I'm hoping to uh, get information to facilitate uh, research improvements and advances. For example, right now what we're doing is autonomous lane following. We're building a car to be able to follow lanes, stay kind of in the middle of the lanes, uh, without much information except for pre predominantly visual information that it perceives as it drives. That's an extremely difficult task because typically in autonomy you have things like GPS, which gives you very precise lo location. And especially indoors, we don't have such precision in terms of location. So this becomes a more challenging problem. It tests uh, the technology that uses just purely visual information for this task. And this project may also prove beneficial for the architects designing the cities of the future. I mean, it certainly shaped the way that I'm, you know, moving forward in my research and, and thinking and really the questions that I'm asking um, about the urban and architectural environment in relation to urban scale AI and, and autonomous vehicles come from thinking about this project. So we're now working on drawings of cities with unusual transportation systems or innovative smart cities and thinking about how policies are being developed in those places um, and at the same time thinking about how the scope of safety, public health, dealing with problems like climate change that have been so greatly exacerbated by vehicles, how we can really improve upon those things given the introduction, wider introduction of autonomous vehicles into our lives at the scale of the city, our globe. <laughs> For more St. Louis stories, subscribe to the HEC YouTube channel. Connect STL from HEC Media. From the world's largest Pac-Man machine. 
to the world's smallest chess set. The City Museum's new exhibit reveals secrets behind some of the most astonishing Guinness World Records to ever be set. We have a great relationship with Ripley's and Guinness and they have this wonderful exhibit that was traveling and it just so happens they had this great open window of opportunity for it to stop here at City Museum. On the third floor in what is typically the architecture hall, the science of Guinness World Records hopes to leave visitors astonished as they discover what goes into accomplishing the seemingly impossible. And so what's great about this exhibit is it's very hands-on, very play-oriented, very competitive, um, and it's really inviting for families and friends and everybody to come and really get hands-on with Guinness World Records. When you first enter, you create a personalized avatar. So as you are moving around the space, you can sign into each different game and your character will come up on screen and you can get different um, scores, you can be on the leaderboard, you can compete against your friend, you can take pictures of that, you, know, you can brag about it. Compete in a dance-a-thon and see if you can beat the record holder. See the world's smallest movie created with atoms and then try to create one yourself. Then explore the world's largest panoramic image. But you can go way in. This exhibit also teaches the science behind how people achieve these records. These records are largely focused on reaction, endurance, and focus. And so if you can focus enough and learn how to solve puzzles, you can compete against the world record holder of puzzles. So it's just really cool that with a little bit of learning, your gameplay can actually improve and you can see yourself kind of ratchet up on the leaderboard. If you have a good memory, play Guess Who and see how many names and faces you can memorize. On the other side, learn the science like picture a person's name written on their forehead. We have other ones that are really fun to compete um, with two people. So there's a boxing game that it's like who can box the most. And again, it's the science of how do you do the most punches in the uh, 30, 45 second window that you have to do. You can also participate in creating a Guinness World Record, the largest collection of hand claps. The City Museum knows a thing or two about world records. We actually do have some Guinness World Records here. One of them is the infamous pencil. So we actually have the world's largest pencil. It's in our skateless park also here on the third floor. We also uh, store two other Guinness Record items. One of those being the world's largest seesaw and the other one being the world's largest tennis racket. But due to their condition, they are uh, in storage and not on display. Not only will you learn about world records here, but you can also try to break them. Although it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, not yet. I feel like I haven't heard that big like alarm go off that was like somebody broke the world record here today. It's a place where kids can learn that it's not magic, it's science. So if one person can achieve the incredible, then so can you. So there's just a lot of really good, fun, competitive spirit going on in here throughout the day. The Science of Guinness World Records is at the City Museum through April 14th. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Mid-America Emmys. Kelly's, Natoa's, Aurora's, and other awards. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Hundreds of nominations and wins from regional to international levels. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence, plus so much more. And although doing good work is its own reward, recognition, well, it's nice too. See what all the fuss is about. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. The St. Louis Arch may be the biggest thing that's uniquely St. Louis, but there are some smaller things too that few people realize. One thing that's really cool about St. Louis St. Louis has a historically high bee diversity in part because of our unique sort of ecological placement. Nicole miller Strutman is the Lawrence L. Browning Jr. Chair and Associate Professor at Webster University. 
Her lab studies bees in urban and wild environments. So we have cliffs, we have forests, we have prairies that were all here historically. And so with that comes the, the bees that evolved in each of those habitats. Prior work has shown that the city of St. Louis alone houses 200 species of bees. That's almost half of what's found in the entire state. And we still have most of them. Understanding how to conserve them within that landscape is really important, a human-dominated landscape. So in 2019, Miller Strutman started the Shutter Bee Citizen Science Program, a research study focused on learning more about the bee population in the greater St. Louis area. So we were interested in understanding how gardens are supporting that diversity within the St. Louis region. The Shutter Bee Project spanned four years. It recruited citizen scientists to help with the visual documentation. Upload them to an app called iNaturalist. iNaturalist has thousands of projects on it from all over the world. The project allowed people to contribute to the environmental science study from their own yards or any space they can visit regularly. Interested in how the landscape and urban environments might influence bee populations. What they discovered is that bee diversity in residential and community gardens is actually higher in the city than in the suburbs. But what they found is that what individuals or communities do with their gardens on small scales really matter, especially where biodiversity is underrepresented. What you do locally actually really matters. It it does matter a little bit if you're in the city, but no matter where you are, if you plant a diversity of native flowers, you get a greater diversity of native bees. And the biggest example of that is the finding that uh, Ned made in his garden. Ned Siegel was one of the project's 225 participants who collectively observed more than 30,000 bees over four years. There are thousands of native bees. Outside of the city of St. Louis, in Belleville, Illinois, Siegel observes the bee activity in the garden he created. Almost natural area, and it has really high diversity, and with that plant diversity has come this bee diversity. So it's really empowering. It's also encouraging that what we do, the decisions that we make at a small scale, can be helpful for these species at a larger scale. He documented the arrival of the little visitors by taking their pictures. He uploaded the photos to Shutterbee for bee identification, including the bumblebee Siegel found last July in his garden. And that's what started all the buzz. Boom, 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 boom. All the experts saying, wait a minute, this is a, this is a rare bee. Or he identified the lemon cuckoo bee, which is a rare bee. It hasn't been found in the St. Louis metropolitan area since the 1800s, 1854. This bee is a parasitic bee that requires a high population of other kinds of bees. This finding demonstrates there's a high enough abundance of other bees that this rare cuckoo bee can persist. Through the study, Miller Strutman also found that the photo survey protocol for citizen scientists documents the same biodiversity as the traditional lethal netting methods. So while the Shutterbee protocol won't work for all projects, Miller Strutman says it could be used to monitor bees without killing them. She says the crowning achievement goes to the Shutterbee community and everything they learn from one another. She says participants connected deeply with the bees in their garden, bringing joy to everyone involved with Shutterbee. And she says participants like Ned Siegel, who were incredibly engaged, added so much to the research. <laughs> Since 1894, Victoria water lilies have been on display at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Originally, gardener James Gurney grew the lilies in London and were a favorite of young Queen Victoria, whose name has been attached to them ever since. He eventually found a job under Henry Shaw in St. Louis and brought the lilies with him. The plants crave the heat and humidity of the tropics, which make August prime viewing time. The pool water they're grown in is dyed black to provide reflection and showcase the beauty of the flower.
HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. My name is Katie Houck. I'm the Executive Director for Urban Harvest STL. We are a nonprofit that manages five urban farms within the city of St. Louis. Our mission is to build community around local and resilient uh, food systems. We do that by both growing food and donating that to other nonprofit partners that then distribute that to communities that have low access and are low income and might not have the available produce or land to grow themselves. We also have a lot of emphasis on education and teaching people how to grow no matter what their resources or their space may be. Everything that we do is in partnership with another organization that has invited us into their space. And that really is a basis for a lot of our programming. We have people that are coming to us that have never gardened before and want to start a raised bed in their backyard. We have retirees that, you know, they're, they're done with their working lives and really want to reinvest in gardening, which they may have done, they may not have done. Um, and we also have people that are wanting to start community gardens for their neighborhood. The organization was really forced to look at itself and see what is our mission, how does this align with what the needs of the community are, and what more can we be doing? And so that's really when I think education became more of a centerpiece of the mission. We have a early childhood education garden program. We have two farms that are located at early learning centers and received some USDA funding last year to expand that program. And so a lot of this off season really has been planning for how do we grow this program? Currently, we're part of a collaborative with four other BIPOC-led urban farms in St. Louis. This collaborative will again provide additional education, expand the audience that has access to these trainings, as well as provide these small seed grants to again support people in what their growing issue or their interest may be. And so a lot of the off-season has been planning that and, and structuring it and meeting with these partners. We're going to need to be a little more innovative and inventive in how we're growing during the off season. And we hope to be able to do more. So a lot of the things that we do to prepare our farms, we want to develop some workshops that will help others do the same thing. Ethical community engagement really is the foundation for what we do. We're always learning. By, by no means do we have this thing down but I hope that we're moving in the right direction and really value the relationships that we have built and, and only look to strengthen those. Later on Spotlight, celebrating St. Patrick's Day with a song from Brian McNeil. History Spotlight. Brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hello, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, president of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis, and this is History Spotlight. Public historian Cecily Hunter introduces us to two African-American St. Louis war heroes. At the intersection of war, valor, patriotism, and race, we can tell the story of two black veterans that lived here in St. Louis. Private Udell Chambers, as well as Staff Sergeant Deruther Brown. Staff Sergeant Deruther Brown was actually born to Mr. and Mrs. A. James Brown in February of 1944. He actually attended Vashon High School. He played on the basketball team, as well as uh, was a part of the Red Cross Committee. In 1963, he enlisted in the U.S. Army. Four years later, he began his tour in South Vietnam, serving as an armor intelligence specialist in the 1st Infantry Division, Troop B, 1st Squadron, 4th Cavalry Regiment. He sustained multiple wounds and fragmentations that eventually led to his death during the Tet Offensive in 1968. His remains were then gathered and brought back to St. Louis, where he was then interned and laid to rest. For his war effort and valor, he received the Purple Heart, the Silver Star Medal, and the Bronze Star Medal. 
Private Udell Chambers was born to Tommy and Betty in February of 1948. He was actually raised in Meacham Park and he attended Kirkwood School. He became beloved by his community and was known for his efforts and his skill set on the baseball field. After high school in 1966, he would go on to actually participate in the Atlanta Brave minor leagues baseball team, where he played for two seasons. In 1967 season with the Lexington Braves, he hit 12 home runs, stole 28 bases, and had a .325 batting average. Though by September of 1967, his career was cut short due to being drafted for the war. Private Udell Chambers was killed on June 21st, 1968 in South Vietnam when a hostile rocket fire struck his military base. For his sacrifice and his bravery, Private Chambers was awarded the Purple Heart, the National Defense Medal, the Vietnam Campaign Medal, and the Vietnam Service Medal. Next week on History Spotlight, how the only woman on the 1904 World's Fair Governing Board earned her spot. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Ireland. A place of breathtaking beauty and quaint charm. An island steeped in history, lore, and mystery. An ancient manuscript speaks of a Gaelic past that could upend history, but is it true? It would change the way the Irish and 40 million Irish Americans view their shared past. We've had these presumptions about Gaelic society, that it's a bit backwards relative to English society. Now, for the first time, archaeologists are working to unearth new information about what may be a uniquely Gaelic way of life. It's outside the area where the Angonomes had the control, really, from, the, say, the 13th to 15th century. How did a proud people work, live, and rule when free of English control? We have begun to search out the answers, to try and find those people again. Uh, that seem to have become invisible. This is all territory that literally nobody has ever worked in. The ancient writings tell of powerful Irish kings and lords, but hard evidence has been elusive until now. They are not copying this new culture. Really, the, the great thing is that we've hit really good archaeology very quickly. Dr. Finan and his colleagues are opening up a whole new area that we didn't know anything about. Join these researchers on a quest to solve one of Ireland's great mysteries, True Gaelic, searching for Ireland's lost history. You can find HEC Media's True Gaelic on Amazon Prime and iTunes. Go to hecmedia.org for the arts and authors. Completely accidental because I never set out to write a book. Culture and community. It's considered to be the oldest organic farm west of the Mississippi. Science. I'm wearing 3D glasses, We're operating on a high definition screen. And history. I was really blown away by the strategy that was used through the Underground Railroad. Education. I look forward to the day when they graduate high school. I want to be a part of that. Films. It's a long cost penny. Finding the coin places the site firmly in the 13th century. What's happening now around St. Louis and more. This is powerful, seeing my mother's story being told. Search all of HEC Media's award-winning content. HEC Media has earned the Mid-America Emmy Award for Overall Excellence four times. See for yourself at hecmedia.org. Come, bunny lass, lie near me. Let the brandy cheer you yeah. From the road from Faith to Falkirk Slang and cold and wet and weary My trade it is the weaving At the bunny town of leaving And we'll drink to the health of the farmer's dames While by my cloth from all You can see them on the lands of the fair Or the fourth and the cannon water Working lands and lands to hear That's what sell you the promised daughter 
soldiers back with the German awards, peddling them something of wonder. Why is we an Ivan Bale and the guy of the Christ and Fair and Falkirk? And you're dealing the pony, for the path is steep and stony, and we're three lang weeks to the Isle of Sky, and the beasts are thin and bony. Take the last of the cellar, and we'll buy ourselves a chill or two, and we'll drink to the lads, we'll buy the guy in Falkirk Town the morn. You can see them on the lads of the fair, lads of the fort and the cannon wad, working lads and lads with gear. What sell you the provost daughter? Soldiers back to the German wards, peddlers up there the border. Lassies me and I from there and the guy at the Christ and fair at Falkirk. I stand here and I'll show you, but there's the tin below you. But you'd best find here in the barn and act for the night watch to me know you. My brother, he's a plough man, and I'm for being no man. And we'll drink to the price of the harvest corn and Falkirk town the morn. You can see them on the lads of the fair, lads of the fort and the cannon wood. Working lads and lads we gear. What sell you the brother's daughter? Soldiers back to the German wars, peddlers up there in the border. Lassies me an eye for near than the guy at the taste and bear at Falkirk. Now the work of the weaver's over, likewise the day of the drover. And the blown boy sits on a tractor now too high to see the clover. And the working's no so steady. But the lads are all still ready to drink the good health of the working man in Falkirk Town the morn. You can see them on the lands of the fair, oh the fort and the cannon water, working the lands and lands we hear. What sell you the province daughter? Soldiers back to the German wars, peddlers up there the border. Lassies we and I from there from the guy at the Christ and fair at Falkirk. You can see them on the lands of the fair, or the fort and the cannon water. Working lads and lads we hear, what sell you the province daughter? Soldiers back to the German wars, peddlers up there the border. Lassies we and I from there on the guy. At the Christ and fair at Falkirk. Next week, we'll introduce you to some minority-owned businesses that have been growing on Cherokee Street. Plus, an eclectic band gaining local fame by spreading positivity. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.